The story of Michelangelo's David is anything but the story of a teenage boy king who slew Goliath. In one of his poems, Michelangelo wrote, Son di essere brutto, I know I am ugly. His nose was broken and appeared crushed into his face, which he said gave him the look of a beggar. He was tortured by his appearance and alienated from his own body. Despite, or perhaps because of this, he would spend his life in pursuit of sublime perfection. He could do little about his own looks, but he would make sure his David would be the standard by which male beauty would be judged. Michelangelo believed that he was a tool of God. He wasn't creating a sculpture from marble, he was simply releasing the figure imprisoned within it. Unfinished work by Michelangelo gives us many insights into his techniques. Most sculptors would create a clay model and then mark up their block of marble to know where to chip. But Michelangelo worked mostly freehand, starting from the front and working back. To sculpt in marble, you need the strength of an athlete and the dexterity of a surgeon. Any slip-up can destroy years of work. Michelangelo would start by what is called roughing out, taking the bulk of the weight off with a point chisel and a large mallet, for getting it down to the general shape of the sculpture. Then he'd use a tooth chisel and a smaller hammer for more detailed work in modelling the form. As he needed more details, he'd use finer and finer tooth chisels. He would use a drill to get into the deeper crevices. Then he would refine using various smaller tools, followed by finishing the surface with a tool like the rasp, a sort of file. Finally, he would polish the statue using abrasive pumice stones and then leather until it is smooth and glossy. If we look at his unfinished work here, we can clearly see the sculpture emerging from the stone. The marks we see here were made by Michelangelo's own hands. The outer parts show us where Michelangelo started to cut away the stone with a large pick and a mallet. And in this area, we can clearly see he has used a tooth chisel. Here on the chest, we see even more detail and the marks are fainter where he has used much finer tools. Michelangelo was 26 when he was asked to sculpt a colossal statue of the biblical hero David to be placed on the roof of the cathedral in Florence, 80 metres above street level. Only two years before, he had carved the achingly beautiful Pieta in Rome, and he was already considered a master. He was asked to use an old block of marble already owned by the cathedral that had been sitting around for 50 years. Two other sculptors had attempted to use it, but the marble was flawed and considered too narrow to produce a successful figure. One sculptor had even carved a large hole out between what were to have been the legs of his figure. But where others saw flaws, Michelangelo saw opportunity. Because of the shape of the marble, Michelangelo had to be precise. There was no room for manoeuvre. David had to look to the side as there wasn't enough marble to have him facing forward. David had to be in the contraposto position so that his legs would fit around the large hole already in the marble. And he would have to be slender because of the depth of the marble. The story of David and Goliath is the biblical story of the Philistine giant defeated by the teenage Israelite, armed only with his sling. The finale of the story is David cutting off his head and holding it up to the cheering crowd. Traditionally, David had been portrayed at the point of victory, triumphant over the dead Goliath. Florentine artists like Donatello and Verrocchio depicted their own version of David standing over Goliath's severed head. All statues are more than mere representations, but Michelangelo's take on it would be revolutionary. By removing the conventional attributes of the biblical hero, stripping him down, both literally and figuratively, 
Michelangelo also removes a simplistic reading of it as just an illustration of the story and gives it a wider metaphorical meaning. For the first time in art, David is depicted before the battle rather than the moment of victory. This changes everything. First and foremost, Michelangelo's David depicts rationality. David isn't about to fight Goliath with brute strength, but with skill and reason. David represents the humanist ideal of a man who can become a hero by his intelligence and willpower alone. These are the virtues of the thinking man, considered perfection during the Renaissance. Michelangelo catches him at the peak of his concentration as he contemplates the challenge ahead of him. David is no longer the traditional self-assured boy. Now he is shown as an apprehensive man. David's neck is tense. His thigh muscles are flexed. His nostrils are flared and his brow is furrowed with fear. He is just about to glide easily and naturally into action. He is tense but contemplates the challenge ahead of him with a calculated gaze. The rock is hidden inside his right palm. The slingshot rests on his shoulder and hangs down his back, almost invisible, emphasising that David's victory was intellectual. His chest appears to pulse with anxiety. Like all of Michelangelo's sculptures, the viewer sees David at a specific and pivotal point. It is not meant to be the whole story. David is in motion. The position he is in is known as contraposto, or counterpose. It was invented by the ancient Greeks and is a very natural and human way to stand. The red lines show where his muscles are tensed and the yellow ones where his muscles are relaxed. Most of the weight is on one leg, with the other leg forward, causing the figure's hips and shoulders to rest at opposing angles, giving a slight S-curve to the entire torso and therefore giving the statue a more dynamic look. The story of David and Goliath would come to represent the city of Florence itself. During the Renaissance, Italy was a collection of city-states, each with its own ruler. The newly independent Republic of Florence saw itself as the David of Italy, holding out with unexpected strength against the Medicis and the powerful and all-consuming influence of the Pope in Rome. This point was emphasised when David was placed in a secular spot rather than its intended religious one. Commissioned as a statue of the biblical story, in Michelangelo's hands it becomes something else entirely. The proportions of David are not typical of Michelangelo's work. The figure has an unusually large head and hands. But Michelangelo, who had dissected many cadavers, understood the human body better than any physician. As per the commission, the statue was designed to be seen from 80 metres below. In 2010, a fibreglass replica was temporarily placed in the spot originally planned for David, and we can clearly see that the proportions work perfectly when seen from below. Nudity was unusual at the time for a biblical story, but the Renaissance was a decisive time for the nude in Western art. A renewed interest in ancient Greek and Roman art brought the human body to the forefront of artistic innovation during the Renaissance. Achievement in representing the body became the standard for measuring artistic genius. It is far harder to depict a nude figure than a clothed one. It is a myth, though, that Renaissance Europeans were comfortable with nude bodies in art, particularly when displayed in public. In fact, the city fathers had a garland of 28 gilded copper leaves made to protect David's modesty, and in later years he wore a fig leaf, as in this photo from the 1860s shows. Why is the Jewish hero David not circumcised? Again, we can trace this back to the inspiration for the Renaissance, the ancient Greeks and Romans. They regarded circumcision as barbaric, and there are no depictions of circumcision in ancient statuary. Also, the Catholic Church denounced circumcision in the Middle Ages. The Jewish figure of David has been placed into the Christian context of Florence, a hallmark of the High Renaissance. It has been remarked that David's penis is rather small. This was considered an indication of modesty and respectability, and shows that the biblical figure is in control of his own urges. 
We can contrast that with contemporary images of satyrs and other figures which represented evil sexuality. David has a slight squint. It is rarely remarked on, but his eyes point in slightly different directions. This is a typical Michelangelo trick to pull us into the eyes of David. The pupils are carved out hollow to capture the changing sunlight, adding to the intensity of the gaze. Michelangelo calculated every angle and always considered the position of the viewer. The details are extraordinary. My own favourite is the jugular vein, which is swollen. This only occurs when people get excited or nervous. Michelangelo understood this over a century before scientists would describe the circulatory system. The veins in the raised left hand are delicate, while the veins in the hanging right hand are pulsing and more well-defined. The way our blood circulates, this is exactly what would happen to our own hands in the same position. Every detail points to Michelangelo's passion for human anatomy. Michelangelo, who never wasted a minute of his life, worked morning, noon and night on David, alone and in total secrecy. At night, he would attach candles to his hat. He rarely ate, and when he did sleep, he slept in his clothes, which he seldom, if ever, changed. In 1504, he finally presented his giant to the cathedral committee. They were astonished at Michelangelo's skills and agreed it was far too perfect to be placed at such a height. They decided to find a better location and eventually decided it should be placed in the political heart of Florence, in Piazza della Signoria, in front of the town hall, where its copy still is today. One member of the committee tried to persuade them to place David in a less prominent place. His name? Leonardo da Vinci. David is truly a colossus. At nearly six metres tall and weighing six tonnes, it took four days and 40 men to move the statue half a mile from Michelangelo's workshop. In a gesture of defiance, David was placed facing south towards Rome. Michelangelo then added the finishing touches on site. Originally, the sling and tree stump support were gilded with gold, as seen in these reconstructions. David received a rapturous reception from the Florentines, and right from the start, it was hailed as a masterpiece and a symbol of the Republic. The Italian 16th century historian Giorgio Vasari wrote, After seeing this, no one need wish to look at any other sculpture or the work of any other artist. In 1873, David was moved to the Academia Gallery to protect it from environmental damage. And in 1910, a full-size copy was placed in the square. His fig leaf was eventually removed and David could be seen as Michelangelo intended. Statues have power beyond their initial reading. One man's hero is another man's symbol of oppression. Michelangelo would go on to create many masterpieces, but his miraculous transformation of a shepherd boy into the physical embodiment of Florence would prove to be a defining moment in his artistic career. He was an alchemist who turned marble into flesh and bone and brought a psychological insight and physical realism to sculpture never seen before. He died in Rome in February of 1564, still working at the age of 88 years old, having outlived both his arch rivals, Leonardo da Vinci and Raphael. He was brought back to Florence to be buried in Santa Croce Church, just a stone's throw away from his divine David. <laughs>